G'day guys, Dean from Blog for the Blood God here, and it's no doubt that chess clocks have helped the 40k tournament community slay the evil dragon that is slow playing assholes. It's definitely solved that problem. However, in today's video, what I want to discuss is some of the new problems that have emerged. So we've created a power vacuum where people don't have an easy way to cheat, and being 40k players, one of the things we do best is problem solve. So there's a small portion of the community that have found a way to use those chess blocks to gain an unfair advantage. So what I want to do today is share with you some of the experiences I've had on how people have weaponized chess blocks against me and some of the stories that I've heard from friends and other people around the community and how chess blocks have been weaponized against them so that we can have a bit of a conversation on how we can go about preventing this behavior from propagating and continuing going forward. So I've got a few ideas, I'd love to hear your ideas, and with that being said, let's get into the episode. Alrighty, so today I want to talk a little bit about chess clocks and about some of the challenges that I see with chess clocks and uh, some of the ways that you can work around them and protect yourself from these challenges. Um, now, it's worth noting at the start that I think chess clocks are overall probably a good thing for the game. Um, and I remember back in the day when slow playing was a legitimate thing that people would intentionally do where there was no real protections against it. And for those of you who aren't from that time, the slow playing was essentially when you knew that your army had a strong turns one, two, and three, but a soft turns you know three, four, and five, or something like that. Um, so what you would do is you would intentionally play really slow so that the game ran out of time by turn three, and therefore you got your really strong turns, you did your massive damage, whatnot, but your opponent didn't get their strong turns, you know? Um, so it might have been something like just an army where it's got a shit ton of really easy to kill objective secured models, right? So turns one, two, and three, you're doing really well because you're throwing out all these models onto objectives and you're, you know, taking over the table, but you don't have the staying power to actually last out the game. So what people would do is they would take that army and then they would play really, really slow so that the game would only get three turns and then they would survive the game and their opponent would just lose. So that's what slow play was. It's basically the weaponization of the round time in order to get a win that you otherwise wouldn't have gotten. Um, so basically that was what slow play was. And then the introduction of chess clocks came along where basically you'd put the clock down and you'd time how much time you spent doing things, how much time your opponent spent doing things. And if they ran out of time, they would have to stop. Which means if your opponent decided they were going to go real slow and they took an hour on their first turn, well, if you're playing three hour rounds, that means they've only got half an hour left to do all of their remaining turns. So really effective solution. And, and there was a period there where it seemed to just be a magical solution and it just solved all of our problems. However, I think we're at a stage now with competitive tournaments where we've gotten used to chess clocks to the point where almost every single tournament you go to, whether it be an RTT, a little, you know, game store tournament, or whether it be a super major, you'll see chess clocks all over the place. Um, how it, so we've got to a stage where they're so popular that people have actually found a way to weaponize the chess clock itself and actually be counterproductive. And that's one of the things, like, as much as you, you'll criticize these people, and, and I do believe that these people are wrong, you have to credit when credit's due. Uh, part of what makes 40K so fun and exciting is the problem-solving component and ways that you can use various tools at your ability to gain an advantage. So whether that be writing a strong list, whether that be by having, like, strategy sessions with coaches or whatever, like, the, all of these different tools that you can use to improve your results on the table. That's really fun, um, creative exercise, I guess. I guess the challenge is some people don't know where to stop and they start using angle shooting or they start using like, you know, um, morally questionable methods to get those results. And slow playing was an example of that and now weaponized chess clocks are an example of that. 
So what I want to do in this video is just go through a few different ways that people have weaponized chess clocks. Now these are either their stories that I've heard of or things that I've experienced myself. Um, examples that I have uh, real world experience in. Um, and then I'm going to go through each one of those and then try to discuss some various ways that you can sort of insulate yourself from people doing it to you. Um, okay, so I guess we'll let's get stuck straight into it. So one of the first ways that I see people weaponize the chess clock is they become excessively hawkish on your movement and your um, actions. So the way that chess clocks work is obviously while ever you're doing an action, whether it be moving a model, piling in, fighting, rolling dice, all of that sort of stuff, the ch your clock will be timing down. And when your opponent is, their clock will be timing down, right? So there's a lot of shortcuts that are like we all do in every game to speed up the game, right? And these shortcuts, I believe, are an objective good because even though they you know, if, if there's a chess clock on, you, you kind of don't want your opponent taking shortcuts because that means that they're getting essentially free time. However, if you take the chess clock out of it, you both want to be taking as many shortcuts as you can to speed up the game. So an example of a shortcut that almost everybody does is when you're moving, say you got a unit of five tactical marines, when you move them, you measure the first model, right, and then you move him, and then you just move the rest up so that they maintain the same sort of formation that they had at the start of the move. Everybody does this all the freaking time. You don't measure every single model. You just measure the front one. That's the maximum move. You know, can he get onto that objective? Yes, no, or can, you know, whatever. You move the first model and then the rest of them you sort of just move up behind him, right? However, Technically, when you do that, you are taking a shortcut, and te it is technically possible that that's going to cause problems later in the game. So, for example, if you're moving something that's about to go into do a charge, and then a pile in, and, and then fight, if you do that, sure, the front model you've measured, and then you measure that again for the charge distance, and then you measure that again for the um, like pylons and consolidates and stuff. So that's all fine. However, those back models, the ones that were just stringing behind, if you move them up an extra inch or two during the movement phase, and then you move them up an extra inch during the charge phase, and then you move them up an extra inch during the pylons, all of a sudden you might be fighting with more models than should have been able to fight. So by taking that shortcut, even though your intention is not to gain extra inches, and your intention is not to sort of, you know, get extra models into that fight, if you aren't measuring everything precisely, it's entirely possible that you will make that mistake. So, there, the, if your opponent requests that you measure every model individually, then you sort of have to. And the challenge there is that slows the game down, which is the opposite goal of what chess clocks are supposed to be. And the reason that the chess clocks bring this out is because if your opponent wants to use that chess clock to gain an advantage, what they can do is they can run an army like knights, for example, where they don't have this problem because they're all single model units, and then they can demand that you measure every single model every single time they move. And if they do that, they're slowing you down whilst not taking any damage to their own speed. And that way they can sort of try to hopefully get you to clock out early or they can just put time pressure on you so that you then have all this extra pressure and you're more likely to make mistakes elsewhere because you're more likely to be rushed and panicked because you're worried that you're going to time out. So that's one of the ways that chess clocks can be weaponized against you is people, try, people become excessively critical over your movements and things like that. They get you to remeasure things, they get you to do all this sort of stuff just to slow you down and it's disgusting, you hate to see it, but it's, it's hard because technically they are kind of right in that you should be measuring every single model. Um, so yeah, I guess that, that's, that's one of the first challenges. Now, the workaround I have for this challenge is not ideal and I'd love to hear what you guys have um, or if you've ever experienced this, but what I generally do is I just tell my opponent that whatever standard they're going to hold me to, I'm going to hold them to. I let them set the tempo, I let them decide what that standard is, 
but it's going to be consistent. So if they are questioning every movement that I do, if they're making me measure model by model by model by model, then I'm going to expect the same from them. And I'm going to be hawkish on them the same way that they're hawkish on me. Like, if that's the game they want to play, then fine, we'll play that game. I'm more than capable of playing that game. But it's not going to be fun, and neither of us are going to enjoy it, so how about we don't, right? And if you have that conversation with your opponent, often they'll back down. Often they'll be like, oh, yeah, no, man, fair enough, like, and they'll back off. And if they don't, well, then that's that one in a hundred games that you play where it's just going to fucking suck, you know? Uh, And that happens as well, so you've got to just sort of accept that. Uh, So that's the first way that chess clocks are weaponized and some of the ideas I have for solving them. The other one is in a similar vein where they try to slow you down, which is when your opponent asks you to check rules whilst the clock is on you, but whenever you ask them a rule, they put the clock back onto you as well. So the the rules questions thing is a really interesting and, and in my opinion, unresolved challenge with chess clocks on in, in terms of whose responsibility is it to check the rules and whose time is it. So currently my understanding is that whoever's asking the question the time is on them, right? Because they're the ones slowing the game down and asking the question. However, the challenge here is if, if, if you ask your opponent a question and then turns out you were right and they were wrong, well then surely the time should be on them. So let's say you've got a, you know, Space Marine squad and they go in and you're like, oh yeah, cool, they get uh, re-roll X, Y, Z because of whatever reason, right? And you're like, no, I don't think that applies to them, right? And they're like, yeah, yeah, no, I get it. And you're like, well, can you show me the rule? Because I'm pretty sure you don't get that rule. Then they can tick the time onto you because you've just asked them a question. And then they can fuck ass around trying to find the FAQ. They're like, I swear there's an FAQ. And they fuck ass around trying to find it. Meanwhile, the clock is ticking down on you because you asked the question. And then ultimately, it's revealed that they were wrong. And meanwhile, they've just taken 20 minutes off of your time instead of theirs. So that's one of the other ways that people can weaponize chess clocks. And it's it's a really shitty move. People do it. Some people will agree to pause the clock when looking up rules. However, this also is a detriment because if you're allowed three hour rounds, you get an hour and a half each, right? If you pause that game for half an hour, because you're discussing a rule or you're arguing or you're talking to a TO or whatever, right? Well, now you both only get one hour each, which is effectively the same as just slow playing because sure, that person gets half an hour less, but so do you. And if they knew that they were gonna use less time, like more time than you, well, then that's a massive win for them. So pausing the clock is not ideal, but neither is like keeping the clock going when you're asking a question that turns out you're right. Um, so my work around to this, and this has only ever happened to me personally once, but I've heard many stories of this happening with the chess clock. So my work around to this is if you have that debate, then have the clock on you. You're the one that asked the question, so the clock is ticking down on you, but take note of how long that conversation went, right? So say, you know, if if you, if your chess clock's going down and you've just realized, fuck, we've spent 15 minutes debating this rule and it turns out I was right. That's when you call over a TO and you say to the TO, look, we just spent 15 minutes debating this rule. I was right. The clock was on me the whole time. Can we please amend the top of the clock so that my opponent has 15 minutes left and I have 15 minutes more? And almost every TO worth their salt is going to correct that. Because even though the chess clock rules in the ITC specifically state that it's on the person who's asking the question, it's, it turns out your opponent was wrong, you were right, so therefore you shouldn't be penalised for asking what turned out to be a very necessary question. Uh, it's, obviously it's a very different story if you're wrong. And that leads into the other side of this coin where your opponent can ask questions knowing that they're wrong whilst you're like if if you ask them a question they can intentionally slow down the time 
if they know that you're wrong. So say you ask them, oh, do you really get that rule? Instead of them just being like, yes, here's the rule, I get the rule, you know, you're wrong. They can slowly answer the question, really, really slowly, knowing that the whole time while they're trying to find the answer, your clock is ticking down, not theirs, because they know for certain that they are right. So they know that there's no chance that they're going to be proven wrong and then the TO is going to come along and say, oh, sorry, mate, you know, you were right. So, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it's just a real fucker of a situation. Other situations, real simple ones, like your opponent aggressively clicking the clock onto you for everything, like they hand you one wound and you have one armor save to make and they tick the clock over onto you. So there's all these little increments of time that are ticking down on you but when you hand them one, they don't take the courtesy to click it onto them, even though technically that's your responsibility to, to click it onto them. But ultimately, if you're gonna use a chess clock, it's both players' responsibility to make sure that that chess clock is used consistently and fairly. Um, so they, they'll use it really aggressively. And, and part of the reason that they do this, I suspect at least, part of the reason that they do this is because if they're constantly clicking it onto you and then putting 100% of the responsibility on you to click it back onto them, the probability that they're going to click it onto you and you're going to forget to click it back onto them increases exponentially. And then essentially they're trying to make sure that there's a scenario where they're doing stuff while your clock is ticking down. And that way they can be really, really slow doing their movement phase and then they do their shooting phase, they start shooting and then they go, oh, here's a fistful of saves. They go to click it onto you and they realize that it was on you the whole time. And they knew it was on you the whole time. That's why they were going so slow. But you didn't realize the clock was on you that whole time. And now the clock is essentially either invalidated, which then permits them to proceed to slow play the rest of the game. Or you have to sit there and try and run the calculations and run the maths to try to fix it which takes even further time, time which they can either make sure the clock is paused for or the time that they can say, okay, well, if you want to amend the clock, well, the clock's on you while you figure it out. And then they can just challenge everything you do and everything that you say, they can be like, no, that's bullshit. I only spent five minutes. And you'll be like, dude, it was like 10 o'clock and it's now half past 10 and I haven't done anything in the last fucking, you know, like, there's lots of ways that they can do that and make it just an absolute fucking nightmare. Uh, now, it's obviously, it's worth saying at this stage in the video that I, I very highly doubt this is a common thing. These are exceptional cases, uh, and they're not very common within competitive 40k, but they do exist, and it's worth discussing them so that if you ever do find yourself in that situation, you have some ideas on what you can do to, to fix it. Um, and the only real solution to this one is to just become a chess clock hawk. You just need to be looking at that clock all the fucking time and making sure that it is clicking down on them when it's on them. Keep an eye on them. You know, if they click it onto you every time they hand you a single dice, well then every time you hand them a single dice, you need to click it back onto them. You sort of need, like I said earlier, you need to let, like, let them set the tempo, but whatever tempo they set, you need to keep up with it and you need to stay on top of it so that it's fair because you, you'll often you'll struggle to convince people to like stop being fuckheads but you can meet them in the middle somewhere and that's not to say that you should weaponize it back it's just make sure that any advantage that they're trying to gain that you gain that advantage as well so that it is fair um the next way that people often use chess clocks in a way that I believe is disingenuous is um, when deploying. Now, this is often the first thing, and some people will go, okay, cool, let's just start, the instead of starting with an hour and a half each, let's start with an hour and 15 each, and that gives us 15 minutes, at the, or that gives us half an hour at the start of the game for me to talk about my army and tell you, explain what everything does, and then you can explain what everything yours does, and then we can do deployment, and then when we're about to start first turn, that's when we'll start the clock. That's what most people do, or a lot of people do, and I actually really like that method because it's, it gets all of that fiddly stuff where it's like your opponent's taking ages to explain their army, but you want them to take ages explaining their army because you want to make sure you understand it, you know. 
Uh, it takes all those sorts of things and it just sort of fixes them. But one of the one of the challenges if you start the clock at the start of deployment is so let's say you've got two players who have both got armies with big units in it, right? You've both got a couple of units of 20 something like gaunts or guardsmen or you know cultists or whatever. You've both got a couple of units of 10 like terminators or you know marines or something like that. And then like, you know, a smattering of vehicles and characters, right? So if you've both got armies like that, let's say that uh, you lose the roll off and you have to deploy the first unit, right? So what they can do is they can go, okay, cool, we're hitting play on the clock, it's on you, and then while you're deploying that first unit, they start placing theirs. So not technically deploying it, they just start getting models out of their case and physically placing them on the table, right? Now, if they do this, while your the clock is ticking down on you, you set up your unit of 20 cultists, right? That takes you, you know, a couple minutes to get them all spot on, and they could be real hawkish about this as well. They can make sure you can be, you're very thorough with your deployment, check your coherency, all those sorts of things. So you do your deployment, the clock's ticking down on you. Meanwhile, they've set up one of their units, right? Then you click the, the clock onto them and say, okay, your turn to deploy. And then they go, cool, yep. They just point at the unit that they've set up and gone, I'm deploying them there. And they click the clock straight back to you. So it's taken two seconds for them, but it's taken two minutes for you. And then you go, ah, oh, fuck. And you start setting up your next unit. And whilst you're setting up your unit, they place another unit down on the table. And then you click it over to them. And then they say, yep, cool, deploying these here. And they click it back to you. Now, the challenge here is, again, the, well, the solution, I guess, is for you to tell them you're not allowed to place models on the table at all whilst the clock is on me. And that's the technical rules for chess clocks, right? Because otherwise people will use it to basically get free deployment. They'll deploy their whole army without taking a second off their clock, but they'll take 15 to 20 minutes off of your clock, right? So you can tell them, and you're within your rights to tell them that they're not allowed to place a single model on the table whilst the clock is ticking down on you. The problem here though, is that slows the whole deployment process down. And that actually makes the game take even longer, which is the opposite of what chess clocks are trying to achieve. So again, this is one of those situations where chess clocks have been introduced in order to solve a problem that in some cases, they can actually exacerbate the problem. They can actually make that problem worse because instead of players just cooperating and deploying their armies, you've got this situation where people are trying to use that clock to gain an unfair advantage and therefore they're actually hurting the game and they're actually making the game take significantly longer. So I think the solution to this is quite simple and that is to just start the clock after deployment. This is not an ideal solution though because some people like if you're running knights your deployment is probably going to take five minutes whereas if they're running a horde of you know gaunts their deployment might take half an hour. So there are situations where that's going to be an advantage to one player or the other However, I think that's better than having a situation where one person's able to gain an unfair advantage by intentionally weaponizing the clock, as opposed to one person gaining a slight advantage that's unintentional, and it's based purely on the fact that their army takes a long time to deploy, and therefore they get free time. I think that's, um, I think that's the best solution. Um, but if you have any ideas on, on ways that we can solve that, let me know. Um, I've almost pulled up at work, so I'm going to finish up here. Um, I do have a few other examples of chess clocks being weaponized, which it's unfortunate that I've ran out of time and won't get to. I might do a part two to this episode in the future, if it's uh, something that you guys are interested in. If it is, let me know. Uh, and if you've got any experiences with chess clocks, both positive and negative, or if you have any thoughts on the subject, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to get a conversation going. Uh, and as always, thank you for those who support me on Patreon and those who follow me on Facebook and Instagram and all the other social media platforms and all of you who comment on the videos, that's great. It helps the YouTube algorithms and uh, yeah, I really appreciate the support and uh, yeah, I'll talk to you guys soon. All right, see ya. Alrighty guys, I hope you enjoyed that. 
please like, subscribe, comment, all that good shit. You know the deal. Hit the notification bell and sign up to my Patreon. It's only a dollar a month. You won't even notice it. But the more people that do that, the more I can continue to improve on my quality of my content, improve on the frequency of my content, and all of the things that you've grown to love about this channel will just get bigger, better, and more frequent if you sign up to my Patreon. So yeah, please consider doing that and I'll talk to you guys in the next one. Cheers. Do your objective markers ever get lost behind terrain or other models and become difficult to see? Do they ever get bumped and accidentally moved during a game? And do they ever spark arguments about distances? Well, not anymore. Introducing the blog for the blood god, not even remotely patented, neoprene objective markers. Made from the same material as astronaut suits, or maybe military equipment, or probably neither of those things, this two millimeter thick neoprene synthetic rubber is tear resistant, water resistant, and is designed to last. But that's not all, the blog for the blood god, not even remotely patented neoprene objective markers come in a variety of different designs and styles to suit any faction represented in the Warhammer 40,000 universe. These objective markers are a perfect gift for yourself or a friend and are a perfect way to flex and show your opponent that not only are you a smarter, cooler and better 40k player than them, but you also have more disposable income than they do. For the low price of $25, you'll get not one, not two, but six neoprene objective markers perfectly designed for 9th edition Warhammer 40k. But wait, there's more. For a limited time only, people who sign up on Patreon to support Blog for the Blood God as a Skull Champion tier $5 per month member will gain access to a custom design service where I will design a unique logo to support their gaming club like the one I did to the left here for the Potato Farmers local gaming club here in Melbourne. Follow the links in the description of this video to pick up your set today.